I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Wood. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening to... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. You are listening to Ed and Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon, the province of Saskatchewan. That's in Kanakistan, eh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been doing that bacon a little bit. <laughs> Back bacon. That's what we're supposed to be known for. That, maple syrup, and lumberjacks. Uh, moose, too. I don't know. Maybe people is don't know Is it moose or meese? Okay, no, you know what? I don't the, the, think it's meese. <laughs> <laughs> My incredible, intrepid co-host, Ed, of course, joins me from... What were you doing? Slaying dragons? Uh, what was I doing or last Were you weekend? at a, a... I was at a stag, yeah, oh. that whole uh, cultural thing. Oh, okay, you were... You were okay, <laughs> well, that sounds like fun. Some I, cultural things are fun. I was the, I was the DD, fun. so I, I was, it was chilling. It was, oh, it was I see. Chill. Yeah. So you were drinking Coca-Cola or something. Yeah. And, yeah, I got yeah. you. All right, uh, I am, of course, your host, Ethan. You're listening to us on dailypaulradio.com, as well as LRN, Liberty Express, VVN, and so on and so forth. All the various little corners of the web you'll find us. We are happy to be there. Um... Today, we're switching up our format a bit. because yeah, threw a monkey in, into the wrench. Yeah, no. Ed just decided oh. last minute, why don't we do this? And I thought, <laughs> okay, sure, well, why not? So what we're going to do right away is we're going to connect with Roger Ver. Roger Ver, you might know him as Bitcoin Jesus. He is a serial Bitcoin entrepreneur and investor, somebody who is, uh, I believe he was part of BitAngels. Mm. Uh, so if you're mm-hmm. into the world of Bitcoin, you will know who Roger Ver is. We're going to bring him on in just a moment. Uh, he, I, I wanted to talk. We haven't connected with Roger for a while, and mm-hmm. I think that's that's unfortunate because Roger is always doing some really cool stuff. You'll know if you're in the Bitcoin community. Roger Ver is the kind of guy who throws on martial arts clothing. To go to tournaments, <laughs> yeah. sporting a Bitcoin logo, yeah, he is an evangelist from start to finish. Roger, you should be connected with us now. Mr. Roger Ver, I think you're in Tokyo at the moment, is that right? Uh, Tokyo is usually the home base, but I'm actually uh, in the United Kingdom at the moment for some Bitcoin things. Okay, you know what? Somewhat less exotic. I thought maybe we'd be you know, connecting to the Orient, but... I like Japan, personally, more over than uh, UK, <laughs> <laughs> well, your your home base is 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 Tokyo, so I mean, I don't know. I, I you seem to have an affinity for it. How is the Bitcoin scene over there? Is it pretty active? Uh, it's really, really starting to pick up. Actually, um, the Mount Gox mm. incident, I guess, was a bit of a blessing in disguise. There, uh, everybody in Japan heard about Bitcoin uh, because of that. The mass media, of course, misreported everything, and it was basically reported (laughs) as Bitcoin has gone bankrupt rather than one particular exchange using Bitcoin has gone bankrupt. Um, But lots and lots of people heard about Bitcoin because of that and maybe looked past the mass media's misrepresentations and looked into it and uh, have gotten involved. And there's actually one guy who I guess is kind of similar to a Japanese version of maybe Kim.com type of guy. Mm. Um, He's really on board with Bitcoin and starting to promote Bitcoin to Japanese people as well. There's a bunch of startups that are happening. So uh, the Japanese, you know, had a little bit of a slow start, but uh, I think they're going to pick up steam real, real fast here. Okay, cool. that's cool. pretty neat. I like that. You know, because what you know, I even around here, I I go to mechanic shops and farm fields. I hear about Mount Gox. <laughs> <laughs> I hear about oh, didn't somebody run off with all the Bitcoin? So that that's an interesting conversation to have all the time. It's almost like you said, Roger. Even here, it's kind of a blessing in disguise because then you get an opportunity to explain mm-hmm. uh, just what that's mm-hmm. all about and how Bitcoin works. So it's an interesting sort of uh, uh, you you. Know, awful event that has its silver lining i guess roger you're okay in the uk right now i understand you're there to unveil some kind of cool stuff about blockchain.info's wallet or something why don't we address that because i'm very intrigued by this you gave us a bit of a tidbit before we started recording so i want to know what that's about what's what's going on there yeah, so uh, I'm not actually here in the UK for that specifically, but oh. at, the, at the Bitcoin convention in Chicago that's going on right now, uh, Blockchain.info is going to announce their new Android wallet app that has all sorts of really neat features built right into the app. The one that I'm kind of the most excited about is uh, it actually has a map built right into the app, and it'll show you all the physical locations nearby where you can go and spend your Bitcoin. So different restaurants and bars and things like that cool. uh, right there on a map built into the app, uh, which I think people are going to really like as well. Wow. Um, 
That, that and is, all, all in all, the account creation process is much smoother. Uh, the backups are easier. Like it, everything about the app is really, really convenient. So uh, if you have an Android device, go over to the Google Play Store and just Google blockchain, and you'll find the new blockchain wallet, and you can give it a try. And I, I think everybody will be really happy with it. That's cool. Good stuff. Good I, stuff. How, where, where does the map source its information for merchants and stuff where you can go send your or you go spend your Bitcoin? So we scraped uh, all the data from coinmap.org. Uh, and we actually called each and every one of the, the merchants there to verify that they are accepting Bitcoin. And uh, that took a lot of man hours to do that. And then we sourced some of the data from BitPay and Coinbase as well. And then we'll have a form set up online so that anybody that has a, a physical place that's accepting Bitcoin, they'll be able to add their, their business to the list as well. Oh, super cool. I like that. I awesome. like that a lot because, you know, one of the one of the common objections you hear is, look, where can I go to spend my Bitcoin? It sounds like blockchain.info is going to try and help people integrate that into their daily use of a, of, a, of a wallet is, you know, it'll show you where you can go. That's pretty neat. So, Roger, aside from that, I get, what else have you been up to in the Bitcoin space? Because I know you're always doing something. You, you have your, your uh, multitude of Bitcoin businesses in which you have your fingers. So what's, aside from blockchain.info, what's kind of been happening in your world in respect to Bitcoin most recently? Um, maybe it's not quite as exciting for, for other Bitcoiners, but for me, it's pretty exciting. So basically, uh, I kind of announced, uh, with bitcoinstore.com, uh, that basically, you know, we, we've succeeded with our goal. So today at bitcoinstore.com doesn't seem so interesting or exciting because you can buy all sorts of electronics from Newegg and Overstock and Tiger Direct and, you know, more and Dell.com just announced, uh, yesterday that you can buy direct from Dell with Bitcoin now. But, uh, when I set up BitcoinStore.com, I don't know, maybe two, a little over two years ago, there were absolutely no websites, almost no websites whatsoever that were selling any sort of electronics goods. So uh, when we launched the website, we, we said that uh, once we get some of the other big players on board to accept Bitcoin, we're going to shut down. So if you go over to BitcoinStore.com, uh, now we have a little like thank you message to everybody that got involved. So uh, that's for me, that's fantastic because that's one less thing that I have to deal with so I can free up my time to, to help deal with other things. But uh it was amazing how many people placed orders through that website. That uh, the website worked and it was okay. It was nowhere near as good as you know the professionals at, at Newegg or Tiger Direct or Overstock. But uh, it was a really good way to you know kick things off. And now you know I think Amazon.com is next on the list to start accepting Bitcoin here. It's pretty much everybody but them at this point. <laughs> uh, so for me that that's pretty exciting to to have that of of been such a, a big success uh, in the Bitcoin space. So so. When you have, okay, so for Bitcoin Store's lifespan, how many, do you have an idea of kind of a ballpark of how much, uh, is, how much in sales Bitcoin Store managed to, to do over those about two years? Yeah, it did, um, in, over the course of two years, probably around $7 million or so. I'd, I'd mm. have to check, uh, and that was like at, at the time of the sales. So I'd have to go back and check. Um, right. the exact accounting history, but so, somewhere between five and eight million, I think. That's pretty good. Which is cool. which is pretty good. Awesome. And and did you did you end up converting some of your Bitcoin capital so that you could purchase some of the uh, some of the items that you uh, or rather, I, what I'm trying to figure out here is, I, I think I remember something about Bitcoin Store. Uh, you guys were talking about keeping the Bitcoin that you received or part of the Bitcoin. Did you did you keep all the Bitcoin that you received for sales, or did you convert a lot of that into fiat to pay your supplier? How did that work? Well, I, I kept as much of it as I possibly could in Bitcoin, <laughs> and then eventually I ran out of dollars to pay some of the bills that I couldn't pay in Bitcoin yet. So then I eventually I had to wind up converting some of the Bitcoins into uh, into fiat. But oh. uh, I, I, I put as much pressure as I possibly could on the various vendors that we were using to accept Bitcoin, and I actually got a number of them to start accepting Bitcoin as payment directly as well. And, uh, you know, even, even today I'm, I'm working on getting more and more things to, to accept Bitcoin and, uh, it's really happening. I, uh, my, my business before Bitcoin memory dealers.com, we have a bunch of suppliers in uh, China that we pay in Bitcoin pretty much every week. Awesome. Uh, we're paying them in Bitcoin and they're happy to receive it. And, you know, mm. it's, it's a win-win situation for everyone all the way around. Exactly. I was going to say the, uh, I wonder, uh, if the earlier adopters, uh, they're, they're probably quite a bit happier if they were receiving <laughs> Bitcoin. Uh, most definitely, I would imagine. 
Well, what's um when when you get uh when you get these suppliers accepting Bitcoin? I mean, this is something now that I think of with Overstock.com and Dell. Since Dell is accepting Bitcoin, can Overstock maybe? Because I know Patrick Byrne, the CEO of Overstock, oh, is right. really into Bitcoin. Maybe because they sell Dell products on Overstock.com. Could they now pay Dell with Bitcoin? That's a possibility, mm-hmm. right? So this sort of circle, uh, this 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 self-contained economy, it keeps building, it keeps developing. I think that's incredible. And now it seems like we're we're watching a real quick uptick in how how many merchants are now adopting Bitcoin. Twenty fourteen does indeed seem to be the year of adoption. So you get more and more this opportunity for that circular economy to exist where suppliers can be paid in Bitcoin. I think I don't know, Roger. Do you think this finally catapults us to the moon, as, as some would say? <laughs> I don't know. What's what's your what's your perspective for the near term? I mean, it's 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 hard for anybody to argue that we're headed in the wrong direction. I mean, Bitcoin <laughs> clearly is gaining more users and more merchants and more of everything uh, that'll be required to propel us to the moon. So it, it's pretty clear which direction we're headed in. Just how quickly we'll get there remains to be seen. But with a uh, Everybody spreading the word about Bitcoin. I, I think we're going to wind up there sooner rather than later. Sure. You know, I, I hear I, um, from people who don't quite know much about Bitcoin. They see the price as a, a rapid speculation and uh, overinflated <laughs> or whatnot. So, what what would you say to people who 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 are uh, saying that the price should be maybe hundred dollars? Yeah, it should level off. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think they need to spend a few minutes and, and do some math and think to themselves that. Uh, Right now, today, there's just over 13 million Bitcoins in existence in the entire world. Uh, I live in Tokyo. The Tokyo metropolitan area has more than 35 million people living there. So there's only enough Bitcoins in the entire world for everybody living in Tokyo to have less than half a Bitcoin. Uh, And Bitcoin's a worldwide thing. It's not just for people in Tokyo. It's for people all over the world. Uh, so if you think what you know, does, what's the average amount of of wealth that the average person has divided by however many people there are in the world? Uh, each Bitcoin is going to have you know, e- there's only enough Bitcoin for each person to have a fraction, a small fraction of a Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin at six hundred and something dollars a Bitcoin is just a small fraction of what it is uh, potentially going to be worth if more and more people and businesses start to use it, which it looks like it's going to be. And uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we see each single Bitcoin worth. Tens of thousands of U.S. dollars in the in the pretty short future. Hmm. So yeah. there's there are some issues that have come up for the Bitcoin network recently. That you know, I, I don't mean to take the wind out of our sails. You know, I love all the two to moon talk. But um, what about? Okay, CEX.io or GHash.io, they're both kind of the same organization. Oh. They had actually over 51% of the hash rate on the network at one point, I, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, For a little while, yeah. Which kind of talks about a centralization problem. It seems like there might be a problem in, in how Bitcoin is built with the incentive structure. Roger... Is the 51% attack issue an issue? Is it something to worry about? What's your perspective on this? Yeah, I, I think the incentives are actually aligned where that won't be a problem. Um, GigaHash has recently stated that they're going to limit themselves to, I believe, 40% of the network. Uh, and I'm pretty darn sure that if at any instant they actually had tried to do anything tricky with their 51% of the network, um, people would have instantly switched uh, over to other mining pools. So maybe they could have done something tricky, tricky once for uh, one small instance. But at that point, then everybody would switch. And then that would prove to everybody that, hey, we need to really be uh, vigilant in regards to not letting any one entity control more than uh, 51% of the network. And uh, there's you know great things like uh, P to pool and, and other services like that. So if you're mining with Bitcoin, go and mine with that one so that you're not contributing to this sort of problem. So at the end of the day, I don't think it's a problem. People People don't want it to be a problem and because they don't want it to be a problem. They'll take actions to make sure that it doesn't become a problem. I think in a very general sense, I might agree with you, but in in, in some very sorts of specific, uh, there are some specific problems. So, for instance, I know that miners like to go to large pools because it decreases variance. It yep. gives you more predictability in terms of what sort of profit you're going to be able to squeeze out of a mining pool, which is important, especially when you're considering that the difficulty changes and now your calculations for what's profitable changes, right? So... It seems to me like there are some niggling problems. And in a very overall sense, all of this to me talks about, you know, 
a, a network that is going to be fixed by people who have an incentive to fix it. The market is creating a demand for innovative solutions. And my gosh, if you look at proposed solutions to a 51% attack or even changing uh, the algorithm that uh, that Bitcoin uses from proof of work to something else, there is no end of suggestions. But I mean... I, I I am concerned about 51% because when gigahash.io says we're going to limit ourselves to 40% of the network, that's a centralized sort of trust. I'm going to trust them to limit themselves. I think that's a real problem. And I, I don't know. I, I, I don't take a, a very rosy outlook of it. I think it's, I think well, it's a real issue. Well, there's two parts there. We don't have to trust them to limit themselves. We all, you know, we lost Roger again. Damn internets. <laughs> Damned internets. I, I have a VPN on, guys, because uh, the United Kingdom, because it's a free country, they block and restrict what people are able to access on the internet. Um, if I turn the VPN off, I think we may have a better connection. So I'll do that and be right back. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, as yeah. Roger turns off his VPN in the free world of the UK, we isn't don't. isn't like that's camera central, isn't it? Yeah, that's camera central. That's for sure. It, we've got uh, someone already listening to us anyway, so why not just uh, have open, open this, open and this I, up I the should be back. Oh, there you go. Well, okay. don't worry Good about stuff. it, Roger, because we always refer, we like to say hello every so often to Jeff, our personal information screening concierge <laughs> at the NSA. <laughs> we know he's listening, and it, 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 we just like that we have at least one listener of the program. We, we enjoy that. Um, <laughs> so, okay, you were saying, though, that, that you, you, I mean, it's not really an issue of trust, right? It's uh, ghash.io. Uh, has real incentives, but what about what if, uh, to to limit their uh, their influence over the network? But what if what if Gash.io, let's say, was figuring out a way to short Bitcoin to profit off of the demise of Bitcoin? Isn't that a problem too? Yeah, but there's not really uh, an easy way to to figure out how to do that currently. So uh, maybe in the future that'll be a problem, but at the moment it's not. And if you do the math uh, currently, it's much, much, much more profitable to actually just mine the bitcoins rather than try and do something tricky to short the bitcoins. So, and uh, I believe it's Susan Anthony, a Stanford professor, has done a lot of researches to into that sort of thing. So I would uh, suggest people who are interested in that can Google her. Oh, cool. I'm going to have to look into that. It's, you know, I, I, I think as, as a developing network, I still do consider Bitcoin as an experiment, one that's mm. kind of in the making. Um, but I have high hopes for it. For me, the reason that 51% isn't really a big issue is because there are so many people involved uh, in, in trying to make sure that it's not an issue. There are so yeah. many people who are directly incentivized exactly. to make sure that it doesn't collapse the Bitcoin network. I'm not really worried about it, but I am. I am looking at it with interest. Man, I think it's kind of neat. There's just so much to talk about when it comes to Bitcoin. Like, <laughs> man, I just we're going off on all these different stories, and I really wanted to get Roger's take on mm -hmm. what uh, the new rules, proposed rules. Oh, uh, Super from, Nintendo Lossky's yeah, rules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Roger, the uh, New York Department of Financial Services, I'm sure you'll know, came it comes up with these draconian regulations that they want to impose upon the Bitcoin sensible. economy. Sensible. I thought they were. I thought oh, you said right. they were sensible, sensible. and balanced. Yeah. That's what that's what they're called. Roger, <laughs> would you agree with my description more that they're a little bit <laughs> maybe draconian? Uh, yeah, I think uh, any time. Like I've never met Mr. Lossky. Mr. Lasky's never met me. He's never met uh, any anybody that I have in my circle of friends. Um, it, to me, it just seems absolutely crazy that he thinks he should have any authority whatsoever to tell me and my friends what we're allowed to do with our Bitcoins. Uh, I don't think he would appreciate it if me and my friends got together and put together a list of rules that he has to obey um, that we set arbitrarily. Uh, why should we not uh, you know, be upset when he tries to do the exact same thing to us. So, uh, but, but Roger, it's not him. It's it's the people, <laughs> right? It's 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 the democratically elected <laughs> representatives, and those mm. are backed by the people. So it's the people's will, mm. and the people's will, right? Because the majority matters, right? I yeah, guess. yeah. Yeah, I don't really buy into that whole <laughs> philosophy. So <laughs> I, I think each individual owns their own life yes. and uh, their own body and their own property, and they can choose how to dispose of that as, as they see fit. Well, what do you think that this is going to do? Because these regulations are very onerous, right? I, I think that they really favor banking institutions getting into Bitcoin, and that's about it. I mean, if you're a Bitcoin startup, it's going to be very difficult to do business in New York. I, uh, would you agree with that? With, with, do, do you think there are any specific problems with uh, Bitcoin startups, what they're going to face in New York today? 
Yeah, I, it, it, it's sad, but I don't think that we should be surprised that the existing industry are able to, you know, it's called regulatory capture, where the existing industries capture the regulators and use them to exclude newcomers from competing with the existing business models. And I think that's exactly what we see happening here, whereas, uh, you know, they're, they're basically protecting the good old boys network. Uh, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, Bitcoin is simply a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, and anybody can use it however they want to send and receive any amount of money with anyone anywhere in the world. And that's not stoppable. And uh, Bitcoin works the same whether one Bitcoin's a dollar or six hundred dollars or six sixty thousand dollars for one Bitcoin. Uh, it still will work just fine for people who want to use it, sure. so regardless of what they, laws uh, or what words uh, politicians get together and write down on a piece of paper. It won't uh, alter the the rules of mathematics that Bitcoin is based on. Sure, this is about. It seems like this is about victimizing people because look, <laughs> here's the thing. You look at one of as one of the problems, one of the consequences of these regulations, for instance, is that you can't. An entity is not allowed to create a virtual currency uh, that would be, uh, be like Bitcoin, right? So, this, in fact, these regulations would make Satoshi, the creator of Bitcoin, a criminal. <laughs> that really, that really seems nuts. There's LTB coin, Adam B. Levine's right. uh, project yeah, of yeah. Let's Talk Bitcoin. Um, that's a criminal act in New York. This kind of stuff is really disturbing. It's not. It there's nothing balanced about this approach. This is all about top-down control and stifling innovation, which is really frustrating because the message that Ben Lossky had was. I'm your regulator in shining armor. I will come and I will talk to you. I will see what to do with the Bitcoin community because I want to make it inclusive. And, and there's still people. There's still people. Like I've been reading comments on Reddit. This is good for Bitcoin. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> this is bringing Bitcoin into the mainstream, allowing investors to have more faith in Bitcoin and all this nonsense. What do you say to that, Roger? <laughs> yeah, I think it should be pretty clear to anybody with any sort of moral compass as to who the criminals are here. Uh, anytime someone, government isn't about asking anybody to do anything, it's about telling them. And the difference between asking someone and telling someone is fundamental. It's the difference between making love and being raped. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between working for a living or being a slave. And when these politicians get together and write down words on a piece of paper and call it a law, they're telling us, they're not asking us. So anybody who's paying attention, it should be obviously uh, clear who the good who the good people and who the bad people are in this uh, case and obviously the people using bitcoin that just want to be able to freely interact with others they're on the side of uh, on, on the side of good here and certainly not Lossky. Well, it's just about voluntary trade between individuals, right? Be, being able to and and this, you know, th these regulations in New York are just about quashing that, killing that idea that you can freely interact with somebody else. Free world <laughs> I mean, what a joke. Um, it's a facade. It's a facade, yeah. Yeah, it does seem to be. Roger, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about voluntarism, uh, your sort of oh, philosophy. Just, just, just hold on. I have one more question. So I, I've heard some people... We only have 55 seconds. Okay. So what I was thinking, Roger, was if you want to join us in the second half, would you like to stay for a little bit longer? You got it, guys. Oh, I awesome. see. Bitcoin Jesus, he gives and gives. It is <laughs> truly an honor oh. and a pleasure. <laughs> we need some of that gospel music. Or I could talk like a black pastor. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I look forward to your letters. This is that's That was a bad thing to say. All right. Anyway, we're, we're going to be back after the music, after these messages, right on dailypaulradio.com. Uh, we're going to be continuing to chat with uh, Bitcoin Jesus, Roger Ver. Uh, so stick with us, of course, on the stream or on our website, edandethan.com. You can Twitter at us, at Ed and Ethan. Feedback at Ed and Ethan is what will get us uh, on the email -y tubes. In the meantime, continue, continue listening. Enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. This is Ed and Ethan. So you love the Ed and Ethan podcast, but there's just one thing that could be better. I want some more. What? More? If you thought Oliver Twist had it rough in the orphanage, you haven't seen our PayPal account. Help us stave off starvation and bring you even more great content. Check out edandethan.com and hit the donate button. We also accept Bitcoins. Need the Bitcoin wallet address? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, Didn't catch that? Don't worry. It's on edandethan.com. Zombie what brains? Now from Global Edmonton, the news hour with Paul.
Brains. This is CNN. Brains. This is CTV News. Brains. CBC News. Ah. Brains. Brains. The Ed and Ethan Podcast. Come to where the brains are. All right, and we return once again. You know what? I think I am going to get in trouble over that. What do you think? The black <laughs> pastor so. thing? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I don't know. a little touchy, but <sighs> whatever. Roger, do you think that was a bad thing for me to say? Because I was just thinking, like, we are talking to the Bitcoin Jesus. You could have said but white pastor. We, we, we Would could that have. be racist? No, I'm stereotyping. I don't know. Oh. Roger, do you think I'm going to get in trouble now? I think I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm just glad I'm not a full-time radio talk show host, because if you say enough things uh, long enough, eventually you're going to say something that's going to get you into trouble. That's true. That's true. It's true. Yeah. Guys, you know... Uh, hey, I, you're okay with upsetting people. You know, you do it all the time, too. That's so. true. I've talked yeah. about being a good. button pusher, but I'm a friendly Canadian. That's not... That doesn't jive, right? <laughs> there's so, a facade, and then there's the real Ethan. <laughs> uh, so, Roger, I did want to ask you about voluntarism. Well, I uh, wanted to... I have Oh, I have a I'm question sorry. about the blockchain Ed's got and a the question. rules. Yeah, right. so okay, if, if, the, if these rules that the uh, uh, Super, Nintendo, uh, Super Nintendo Lossky <laughs> wants to implement, if these come become uh, widespread and are the rules in the United States, what would how would that affect the blockchain uh, the blockchain wallet? Um, we're waiting to see. Like our the blockchain wallet is designed fundamentally different than most of these other online wallets, and. Mm-hmm. We're expecting that we actually won't fall directly under most of the regulations because blockchain doesn't actually hold any of the users' bitcoins. We don't control any of the users' bitcoins. We don't have the ability to even know how many bitcoins people have in in their various wallets depending on the security settings they select. Um, So it's pretty clear. And they've already given us some stuff uh, in writing saying that we're not a money transmitter, we're not a money service business and this and that. But uh, I'm not directly involved in the day-to-day stuff regarding all that because uh, mostly because I don't believe in it. I think people should be able to use their money however they want, and uh, <laughs> I don't care what uh, politicians get together and write down words on a piece of paper and call it a law. That doesn't uh, a f- that doesn't change morality one bit in in my book. Right. Well, Same this here. is. That's what I was going to get to ask you about. And I'm sorry, Ed, I just steamrolled over your okay. question. You know, it's what I do. Um, <laughs> when, when, you, when you're talking about, you know, you don't believe in this and that and, and laws on pieces of paper are not something that you want to govern your life, and what, what, I, I, I'm pretty sure you're talking about voluntarist philosophy or, um, you know, for instance, uh, I call myself an anarcho-capitalist because I don't care about the baggage that the term holds. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when you're talking about this kind of stuff, can you give me kind of a, a, a description of the root of your morality? Where does this kind of belief come from that laws on paper are just dictates that I shouldn't have to uh, pay attention to? And it's 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 been a maybe 20 year process uh, in, in my life. And I guess it started out, you know, reading Ludwig von Mises and then from there you Milton Friedman and then uh, eventually made my way over to Murray Rothbard. And I studied all the economics behind government actions. And, and Murray Rothbard explains it really clearly. He says there's, there's two, two sectors to the economy. There's the productive sector, which is private business, and there's the parasitic sector, which is the the government sector, right? So there you have the the side that produces and the side that that leeches off the productive sector. Um, And so it became really, really clear that if you're concerned with the amount of material wealth in the world and people having a high physical standard of living, by far and away the best way to achieve that is through the free market and getting government out of the way so that people can pursue their own self-interest. And then later on I started studying the the you know philosophical side of the thing and uh, realize that each individual owns their own body and if your own body is your own property you have the the fundamental moral right to put whatever you want into your body and and trade your labor for whatever it is that you want to trade it for and work for whoever you want for whatever rate, wage you want to work at for and it really really just started dawning on me just how incredibly aligned what's moral and what's practical are with each other and just what's practical is what's moral and what's moral is what's practical and and that just to me just seems to be such a a strong indication of what the right way uh people should interact with each other is and then uh 
more recently, I came across uh, a lot of you know videos in a book by a man named Larkin Rose. Mm. And anybody who hasn't watched any of his videos on YouTube, I really recommend uh, going there and Googling Larkin Rose, L-A-R-K-E-N-R-O-S-E. And uh, his videos really, really, I guess, kind of popped my bubble again in, in regards to my view of the world. And, and I realized that men getting together and writing down words on a piece of paper and calling it a law don't alter morality in any way. If you think that there is any sort of objective morality, men writing down words on a piece of paper and calling it a law aren't going to change that. Mm. Um, and if, law, if morality is subjective, that still doesn't change it. So, <laughs> um, so anyhow, I really enjoyed that. And then there's another uh, author, uh, Michael, Michael Hume, I believe, uh, who's written a lot of interesting things, and he has some other interesting uh, videos on YouTube. And he's kind of talking about the the myth of authority. And people, I guess, are kind of brainwashed from a young age to believe that certain human beings should have authority over other human beings. But more recently, I've realized that it's just a myth. It's just a brainwashed thing that why, why should, you know, Ben Lasky or anybody or anybody else have the moral right to dictate what other human beings are or aren't allowed to do. And in my view, you know, all human beings have the same natural rights as any other human being. And just because some groups of humans get together and write down words on a piece of paper and call it a law, um, I don't think that creates any sort of obligation on others to have to obey that. Do you think that voluntarist ideas are spreading, becoming more popular and more widely understood? Or do you think that Sean Hannity now calls himself a libertarian, but nothing's oh, changed? Really? <laughs> oh. what, what are, what's your perspective on the sort of intellectual path that this philosophy has taken the world over? Is it really spreading? Uh, if Sean Hannity is trying to call himself a libertarian now, maybe the ideas are spreading. Um, not that I think Sean Hannity is a libertarian, mm. but uh, I think maybe enough people have, have come across that line of thinking to where it's becoming more attractive and more interesting uh, to people. Be and thanks to the internet in large part. I mean, Larkin Rose has some amazing videos with hundreds of thousands of views on his channel. And uh, I can't imagine that hundreds of thousands of people have, have viewed these videos and not been affected or had their outlook uh, changed a bit by that. And uh, I can't count how many times I'm pretty much daily. I have people from around the world emailing me and saying, you know, I found Bitcoin and then I was reading about that and then found, you know, free market uh, stuff or, or voluntarism or anarcho capitalism or whatever you want to call it and email me telling about telling me about how their whole worldview has changed. And uh, even if people aren't fully understanding the philosophy, one of the really exciting things about Bitcoin for me is it makes it so incredibly easy for anyone to have complete control over their money. And uh, I'll tell you a story from my own personal life. I, I have a, a friend who was who's as far from a libertarian as, as you can get, basically. He mm. thinks that the drug laws are wonderful and lock people in jail for using drugs and, you know, the people need to be controlled. And if it wasn't for government, the whole world would come to an end. And he bought, you know, a, maybe around $10,000 worth of Bitcoins uh, back when Bitcoins were in double-digit prices. <laughs> And the Bitcoin price shot up. And this is someone who you know I'd had long discussions with, and he was telling me how taxes are wonderful, and we need everyone needs to pay a bunch of money in taxes so the government can do all these wonderful things. And the instant the price of Bitcoin you know, went up several times, he contacted me one day in, in, in person. He said, Roger, Roger, I need your help. And I said, what, what, what's wrong? What do you need my help with? He goes, I need you to help show me how I can hide my Bitcoin. Because, uh, Apparently, he wants everybody else to, to use their money to pay the government to do all sorts of things. But when it comes to his own money and suddenly he realizes that he has such an easy way to hide it, uh, he doesn't want his own money to go to the government. So I think we're going to see a real big change for even all these people that love and support government. They don't love and support government when it comes to their own money. And when they have a tool as easy as Bitcoin that allows them to keep their own finances private and keep control of their own money, I think a lot of these state worshipers are, are, are still going to um, – they're going to stop supporting the state when it comes to their own money. See, and that's th a good thing. This is mm -hmm. why I, I talk so often about value expression. Mm -hmm. This kind of thing seems to me to be like, well, here you've got you, – you, you have one solution, which is you can appeal to the state structure and you can you can basically be all, you know, let's get this – let's tear the system down from the inside. Let's make it uh, – you know, uh, let, let, let's let's vote ourselves into positions that will affect change and then we can change things. Or 
it always has seemed to me, why not instead just produce something of value that people mm-hmm. then value more than government action? Uh, it seems like Bitcoin's doing that in spades. Uh, Roger, your example is a comical one where I think it really shows that somebody basically when faced with, do I choose the government apparatus or do I choose an independent path that is of value? Now, gosh, you choose the independent path. That path, Ethan, might be the harder path. And we have seen some mart, uh, somewhat martyrs in the movement, Mm. possibly. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Roger here for, uh, uh, helping, uh, Ross Albrecht. Uh, oh, yeah. With the tweets, uh, that was awesome. Uh, well done, sir. Uh, people, you, you are one of the uh, the shining lights in this movement, <laughs> definitely. And uh, so, what do you say to uh, to people that say, uh, "Well, you know, we need to be practical and uh, go through the through the process and and you know respect the process, and that's how you affect change." Or do we become martyrs and have guns pointed at us and have stuff stolen and mm, depressing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, personally, I would prefer not to have any guns pointed at me and <laughs> would prefer not to become a martyr. Um, but you know, there are certain things in life that I think are important enough to stand up for. And, uh, if I can implore your listeners again to go and go on YouTube and Google Larkin Rose and he has a great video and I believe it's called, uh, but who would pick the cotton? <laughs> and uh, yes. we hear lots and lots of people who support the state say, well, who would build the roads? Mm. And Larkin Rose has a, a nice little video where he talks about how we can't uh, just get rid of you know <clears throat> uh, slavery all at once because who would pick the cotton? And, you know, that, uh, and he goes on about how we need to get rid of it gradually and, and have transitions and this and that. And, then, and everybody recognizes that argument's absolutely bunk, like slavery was wrong and it should have been ended instantly. Um, mm. And you don't need some way to gradually get rid of that. And then basically he rewinds this exact, you know, the exact video of him talking about, you know, what, but who would pick the cotton and changes all the arguments that he gave for why, you know, cotton picking by slaves should be continued for a long time. He changes the only words that he changes in the whole video or instead of, but who would pick the cotton it would be, but who would build the roads? <laughs> and he uses the exact same arguments. And when, when you hear his arguments against what, who would pick the cotton, you realize that these arguments are insane and stupid and, and slavery should have been ended right away. And then he uses the exact same arguments that statists try to ju- use today to justify government as to who would build the roads. Mm. And when you watch that video, you realize, wow, uh, what we have today is pretty crazy and we need to end <laughs> it right now. And we don't need some sort of gradual process or, or, or gradual transition. Uh, so it, that video is really, really worth watching, as are just about all of his videos on YouTube. I, I really can't recommend them highly enough. And then uh, there's you know people like Ross Ulbricht. Um, I don't know if he was Dread Pirate Roberts or not. Um, mm-hmm. If he was, I think he's a hero for setting up this website. And anybody who hasn't logged on, and it's very clear, whoever set that up was a very principled, free market, you know, voluntarist type of person. And basically said, you know, this isn't the website for whoever ran it wasn't about making money. It was about allowing people to trade freely with other individuals, free from the coercive, you know, violence of the state. And so whoever set that up, whether it's him or not, is is a hero for having done that. Um, and I would say probably ninety nine point nine percent chance for sure. All the stuff that you heard about in regards to the media for hire, I'm sorry, the murder for hire stuff mm-hmm. that you heard about in the media, is just the government's way of trying to separate support. Because if he had only been arrested for setting up yeah. a website allowing people to buy and sell drugs, he would have become a folk hero instantly. But suddenly people hear, oh, supposedly he was hiring hitmen to murder other people, <laughs> and they, they get real uncomfortable about supporting anything like that, and they, they distance people from that. And I think the government had a huge amount of success in, in you know getting people to not support him because of that. Um, but if you look at it, they smeared his character in the media with that. And then when they actually came to charge him and his his case is due to go to trial, I think November 3rd, mm-hmm. they're not charging him with any of that. Oh, um, oh. Another really scary thing that they're they're trying to say is basically what he's accused of doing is setting up a platform that's similar to eBay, but using Bitcoin and Anonymous that allowed people to sell these illegal things. He's not actually accused of having bought or sold any drugs. He's just simply accused of having set up a platform that allowed other people to do those things. Um, but if you think of it that way, what are cell phone companies? What's the internet as a whole? What's what's you know any sort of piece of technology? People can use technology in, in, in legal ways and or illegal ways or good ways or bad ways. Just because some other people used some piece of technology that he made in a certain way 
doesn't mean that that technology as a whole is bad or that that person that created it should be held responsible for that. Um, what about all the ISPs that uh, provided the bandwidth that allowed people to connect to the Silk Road? Should they be held responsible for that as well? And the obvious answer is no. Um, and But the government's really trying to overreach on this. So anybody that, uh, that thinks that individuals should be allowed to trade freely with others, uh, I would really recommend spending a moment and go over to freeross.org and take a look at the information that's on the site. And uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, donate a, l a little bit of Bitcoin their way because it really will help. And he has a first-class uh, attorney uh, that's really fighting hard for him. And awesome. boy, what a win would it be for all the free market advocates if uh, the attorney is able to succeed and, and get the, either the case thrown out or dismissed or, or win at trial. Sure. Uh, that would just be a huge, huge, huge win for everybody that support, supports individual rights and thinks that individuals have the right to put whatever they want in their body, despite what uh, politicians write down on, on pieces of paper and call laws. Uh, so please go to freeross.org, take a look there, and, and, and donate a little bit of money. And, and tweet about it and post on Facebook and spread the word. I mean, this, could, mm -hmm. this could be a huge opportunity for, uh, for everybody in the entire world that's opposed to the war on drugs. Freeross.org, yeah, absolutely worth a visit. I would agree wholeheartedly with yeah, Roger. Right. You know, when I think of, of what Ross Albrecht has gone through, you know, like Roger, I don't know if he's DPR, Dread Pirate Roberts, the guy who ran Silk Road, but if he is... I'm looking at a marketplace that seemed to be uh, peaceful. I don't know. There might have been some issues with it. Uh, I wasn't really involved with Silk Road, so I don't really know a whole lot about it. I see a lot of controversy about it. But my goodness, your point, Roger, about infrastructure and how people use technology, it, it, it seems as absurd as, you know, driving down the road, you get pulled over and charged for driving with intent to rob a bank. Yeah. You're saying, I was just driving. Yeah. And, no, well, you know, you could have robbed a bank, so we're going to, you know, we, or something like that. It just seems absolutely absurd that people would be penalized for using uh, technology to communicate, to move about, whatever. It, it, it's nonsense. And we see this now, too. There's a there's a news item out there uh, right now where FedEx is being charged by the American government for, uh, for, for dealing drugs. Really? <laughs> because they've been shipped through their system, and FedEx is saying, we're not cops. What's this, right? So mm. it, it, it's all complete nonsense, but it is the overreach of the state. We are seeing some positive uh, news in the drug war. Uh the World Health Organization, even though I think they're nonsense, uh, they do set kind of a general public policy within the world, and they just came out saying that marijuana, uh, cannabis should be legal, uh, decriminalized. Right. So that's that's a positive step. Uh, dis the District of Criminals recently <laughs> uh, uh, made it so uh, small possession or one ounce less than or one ounce and less, yeah. a twenty five dollar fine. Uh, right. So you know, they're, they're, we're slowly, you know, <laughs> within the statist paradigm. Uh, we're slowly <laughs> seeing some progress on that, which I think is great because the drug war is such a... It destroys so many lives uh, just needlessly for nothing, sure. for absolutely nothing. Roger, do you think those are incremental positive steps? Because I, frankly, it just depresses me. <laughs> but what do you think, Roger? Um, what, what I think is that men getting together and writing down <laughs> words on a piece of paper and calling it a law does not alter morality. And so today in states like Washington and California and Colorado and more and more, it's perfectly okay legally for people to use marijuana. Whereas 10 years ago, people were being locked in cages for doing the exact same thing. <sighs> so if it's okay for people to use marijuana in those states today, it says to me that it was okay for them to do it t 10 years ago. And the, all the police and judges and, and jail guards that locked those people in cages 10 years ago for doing the exact same thing that they can do freely today, those people were wrong. And we should look back on what those things that they did the same way we look back on slave owners from hundreds of years ago or, or Nazi uh, concentration camp guards. Like Those people were mistaken and they were wrong and they should be condemned for what they've done in the past. And uh, I think we can forgive them if they apologize for what they've done. But the ones that are in the states that are still doing the same things, what they're doing is wrong and they need to stop. And if I can circle back to the Silk Road again, uh, Ross Ulbricht's been in jail for, I don't know, close to a year now. Um, but whoever took over the website, the website's still up and, and running. A lot of people might not know that, but right on the very front page of that website currently, um, there's a letter to the different people that are using the site. And there's some incredibly powerful stuff that's read there, uh, written there that I would like to read just maybe three lines from that. Mm -hmm. sure. It'll give you an idea of just what sort of philosophy that people uh, running the Silk Road have. Uh, and they say, Silk Road is not here to scam. We are here to end economic oppression. Silk Road is not here to promote violence. 
We are here to end the unjust war on drugs. Silk Road is not here to submit to authority. We are here to defend a foundational human right, freedom of choice. Silk Road is not a marketplace. Silk Road is a global revolt. Mm. Oh. And I think those are really powerful words right there on the front page of the website today. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, and if, if people who are listening, if, if they agree with that sort of thing, that it's an unjust war on drugs that needs to come to an end and people have a foundational human right to be free to choose, go and donate some money to, to freeross.org and uh, you know, help, help provide a voice for this viewpoint. <sighs> It's, it's beautiful, man. I love revolution through commerce. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the mm -hmm. best sort of revolution uh, you can find uh, on the planet. Roger, uh, I want to, I, I want to, I want to uh, leave a little bit of room in this segment. So uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna uh, cut things short. But I really do appreciate the time that you have given us. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to have you on, and I really like the uh, all, all of this mention of. Uh, where your philosophy comes from. Before we let you go, though, I was curious, when did you first get into Bitcoin? When did you first find out about it? And when you found Bitcoin, like everybody else I've talked to, maybe there's an exception for Bitcoin Jesus. I'm trying to find <laughs> out now. Did you, when you first saw Bitcoin, did you think, that's stupid? <laughs> Uh, I didn't think that stupid. Uh, when I first found it, I thought, this is interesting, but too bad nobody's using it. And if nobody's using it, it's not going to be uh, mm -hmm. useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so when, when you first found it then, did you, you kind of just uh, put it on the back burner for a while? You thought, well, I'll look at it later maybe? Yeah, I, when I first found it, it was about 10 cents a Bitcoin. And the reason it was 10 <laughs> cents a Bitcoin is because nobody was using it. And it wasn't until uh, the U.S. government came in and cracked down on all the online gambling that I, I, I saw the mm. use case for Bitcoin because I realized people want to gamble with their own money. And uh, because America is not a free country, people aren't allowed to do that with their own money. And I realized that people would use Bitcoin for gambling online. And that's the, the spark that occurred in my mind that made me yeah. realize Bitcoin was going to take off. Huh. Very cool. Yeah. I like that. Well, Roger, thank you very much for joining us today, and I hope you're enjoying your time in the UK. We'll we'll connect again at some point. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, man. Thank you guys very much. All right, cheers. Well that was that was fun, right? Oh man, Roger is uh he's such a great voice for <laughs> Bitcoin and for human rights, you know, basic human rights for all. I love it. I was talking about the format, but I mean if, sure oh, if you want to if you want to mention the A-list <laughs> guest, I guess that was fun too. Ooh, tsh, what <laughs> The, what the you a, stop laughing. well i was gonna say i was trying to make up some uh joke about bitcoin like a b-list uh bitcoin. oh right but the it bitcoin just doesn't list. work it doesn't work no no you shouldn't try not, to humor i shouldn't <laughs> no comedy is not my thing um, just laughing do you want to do do you want to do a bit of an after show because we're gonna like we don't have a whole lot of time right we've, we've got like three minutes left in the program but we can do a bit of an after show today we right? gotta we gotta tease people to come to the site right and we want oh wanna, yeah wanna bump those numbers uh -huh. come yeah. to ed and .com for all of the compelling content that is ed and ethan talking in the after show incessantly about <laughs> stuff that interests them yeah yeah it's perfect I, it's a good pitch right um because <laughs> i do want to touch on a, a on a couple of stories but also we've got um what was it we've here the crtc uh wireless cancellation policy boosts costs of basic plans didn't we like predict this yeah i think we did we were saying this is like about less than a year ago i think yeah yeah basically what's, so, what's gonna happen hmm economics markets the yeah, price is gonna go up yeah, mm, yeah. so uh -huh. I mean, we, can, we can talk about that but i also wanted to there's an all of this talk about bitcoin has inspired me to remember i had this idea um, okay, my phone, I've mentioned this before, on my phone, I get my data throttled every month. Yeah. Without exception, because I oh, use a sucks. lot of data, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and some people ask me, what the hell are you doing? Porn. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's all music. It's all me. I'm sorry yes, to that's disappoint right. that's right. and be boring, but it's music. But I was thinking about how you could use a cryptocurrency to decentralize or distribute the uh, the cost of bandwidth because right now you get look the cost to stream a gig of bandwidth is in the neighborhood of three or four cents yeah, for a cellular provider yeah like, it, getting charged through the nose for that just 
doesn't wash. It doesn't wash at all. It's really cheap to provide that bandwidth. So here I am getting throttled at, at 10 gigs every month. By the time the month is through, I end up using about 16 gigs. Even if Holy. somebody was... Yeah, even if somebody was charging me, let's say, a dollar a gig over, so that cost me $6 a month extra on my bill. So right? that'd be like uh, 97% more <laughs> than what it really cost the company, well, yeah. 97 cents more, it would be, yeah, it, it, would be, it would be a large profit margin, right? So even if that were the case, I would grudgingly accept that. I would be like, okay, fine, a dollar a month or a dollar a gig per month more, I can I can deal with that. But mm -hmm. but often the charges, if there are overages, aren't so reasonable. Some some of the roaming charges are like I can't remember the numbers, something outlandish like uh, you know, uh, three dollars per every five megabytes or something, wow. or ten megabytes. Like it, wow. it, some of the charges out there, and there's better roaming than that, sure. But some of the charges out there are just absolutely nuts. So I'd like to I'd like to talk a bit of it in the after show about an idea to use cryptocurrency to distribute like kind of create a marketplace for bandwidth mm. and why that could even exist with the players we have today. I'm intrigued. Yes. Check it's out edanethan.com for that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a better pitch. There you go. <laughs> All right. So I hope you're enjoying the new format. It was an absolute pleasure to have Roger Ver, the Bitcoin Jesus, or should I say the Bitcoin oh. Jesus? Uh, on the program, <laughs> good times. Uh, continue listening right here on dailypaulradio.com for more great content. In the meantime, check out edandethan.com for all of our stuff. This is Ed and Ethan. <laughs>